the inside story on the issues that affect you and your community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. We begin by focusing on issue four, the Family Services and Treatment Levy. Issue four is designed to fund programs that provide alternatives to incarceration, reduce recidivism, and preserve limited jail space for the most serious offenders. Although technically a new levy, most of these programs were funded in the past under the old Drake Hospital levy. When that levy was on the ballot, all the debate was about the most efficient way to operate the hospital. The other programs got, you know, a passing mention. Now that Drake no longer seeks local tax support, the other programs are at the center of the discussion. One of the challenges around the issue four is that it will fund a basket of services, each relatively small, not just one big program. These include residential and outpatient drug rehabilitation at 1617 uh, Reading Road, an alcohol and drug addiction partnership and treatment program, the Adapt for Men program, a residential and outpatient program for offenders referred through the Hamilton County Courts. Turning Point is a rehab program for multiple DUI offenders. The levy will also support the Coalition for a Drug-Free Community, the nationally acclaimed Off the Streets program that helps women escape prostitution, and the Substance Abuse Mental Health Court, or SAMI, and others. The levy will raise $37.2 million over five years. At 30.34 mills, that means that for every $100,000 of property value, the owner will pay $10.06 per year. Although this is technically a new levy, it replaces a levy that costs the owner of that $100,000 home $20.73 per year, more than a 50% reduction in the current tax rate for this. To discuss issue four, I am joined this morning by Neil Tillow, the president and CEO of Talbert House, which is a community-wide, not-for-profit network of social services uh, responsible for managing a number of the programs funded by issue four, and Lana Baker, a counselor at Talbert House who works closely with the drug court. Welcome to Newsmakers. Neil, welcome back. Thank you for having Lana, me, Dan. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Neil, this is sort of this umbrella of services. I called it a basket of services. Could you sort of, you know, is there a way of describing this that pulls all of this together, either by t talking about the people who are served or the goal, the ultimate goal? Why are these together under this levy? Well, as you noted, Dan, many, most of these services, the vast majority of them, about over 85%, 90% of them, were in the previous levies, in the health and hospitalization known as the Drake levy. So they're just being pulled forward. And the, the common theme here is uh, helping uh, families who are in need in this community. Uh, the, the, this levy will fund services for about 5,000 people uh, next year, both prevention and treatment. You mentioned the Drug Coalition. This will reach out to coalitions throughout the county. Uh, uh, you know, in the townships and the municipalities. You mentioned the offender programs. They'll, um, they'll continue on, although at a reduced funding level. Um, and you mentioned the off the streets uh, program as well. So the, it's really families in need who, who, who need uh, assistance. And you know, one of the things I frequently ask is, you know, does anybody know someone who doesn't have a drug or alcohol problem? I mean, in your life, either a coworker, a, a neighbor, a family member, a friend, somebody. And almost everybody I talk to does, and that's really who we're trying to reach out to, that these are normal, everyday people who had jobs, who, who tried to make it work, and who slipped, uh, had a relapse, or aren't uh, on the road to recover the way they need to, and we're there to intervene and provide, to provide the assistance they actually need. A significant number of people in these programs yes. are going through the court system, and a really key part of this I want to make clear early on here is these are all alternatives yes. to just putting people in jail that the judges get to use and they mm -hmm. make get to make some decisions in some of these cases right it gives yeah. them a wider range 
not only gives them a wider range, but most folks who need care, need treatment, have to be coerced by somebody. They're coerced by their spouse, their employer, their, or frequently the judge. And when the problem gets bad enough, the court somehow gets intervened. They're picked up for a DUI, or they're arrested for possession, or they, they were trying to pass a bad uh, prescription at a pharmacy, or whatever the case might be. When the court has that leverage, the chances of uh, improvement in their lives increases dramatically because the judges use that leverage quite effectively. In fact, the drug court program has a has an 11 percent uh, recidivism factor, meaning return to some sort of uh, you know abuse or offense, which is really low. Nationally, yes. it's 40 yeah. percent. So it's almost four times better than the national average. Let me get Lana into this. Sure. Um, yes. Tell us the program you specifically work with. Yes. Which is the Adapt for Women Residential Program. And. Adopt meaning in this case, who, these are people who are struggling with what? Substance abuse. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, yes. Go ahead. And there are women that I've worked with from all over the community. In fact, I'm working with a woman right now who is from Harrison, Ohio. And she came in, she had been a middle class working woman, very productive in society. She had an injury, she began to use pain pills and developed some issues around that. And as a result, had difficulties being productive. However, today, she is confident in herself. She is looking forward to a substance-free lifestyle. And as a matter of fact, has obtained employment. Uh, one of the really neat things about our program is that all of our clients are required to obtain and maintain employment throughout the course of their treatment. Even while they're being treated, not, exactly. just, not just a goal at the end. Exactly, in fact, our women are required to obtain employment before they leave the residential component of the program. And then they complete an additional nine months to a year of after care in which they are required to maintain that employment. Now, in the program that you're connected with, mm -hmm. I'm sure you keep records. Neil was just talking about some records. Do you measure your results and is recidivism, is that the, the, sort of the first line to measure things against? Yeah, absolutely. Over a 10 year period of time, as Neil has mentioned, again, we have found 11% recidivism rate, which is far, far less than the national average of 45%. And additionally, I find all the time when I'm out in the community, I run into women that I've worked with who are still working, who look great, they're satisfied with their lives. It's, it's a great feeling. One of the other things we measured, Dan, let me just mention this, is we do drug testing on, on folks. And last year we did 100,000 drug tests. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. only 2% of the people came up positive. Now we're dealing with a, a drug abusing population. It's not like we're going out to the, to the mall. And so these are tests. people who are in various programs or they have been through your program? That's correct. Okay. Exactly. Both. People as, from the assessment phase, residential, outpatient, aftercare, and, and beyond, 100,000 tests and less than 2% of those people had, had positive drug tests. So, you know, the programs are working. It's yes. the recidivism, it's the drug tests, it's the employment, it's the taxes paid, right. all those things. Here's and the, one of ahead. the reasons that the programs work so well is that these programs are run based on evidence-based evidence practices that have been proven to work. And staff are sent to several trainings a year to make sure that they understand and have the skills to implement these evidence-based practices. So we use tools that we know will work with this population. And I know, I've known Neil long enough, that as evidence changes or new evidence comes online, mm -hmm. you change the way so you can be more effective. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sure, of course. The, the flip side of this is the cost of these versus the cost of the alternative, which might be the jail, very honestly. How would you measure that? Well, there's a lot, a lot of measurements around costs. First of all, not just the cost of the jail, which I'll talk about in a minute, but there's emergency room costs. There's mm -hmm. productivity costs that work. There's safety costs that work. Mm -hmm. There are uh, people hurt uh, from DUIs and other things. And then there's the jail costs. Now, the way we think about it is uh, a day of jail is about 65 days, and the average length of stay for Oh, $65, excuse $65, me. $65, right. right. And okay. the average length of stay for uh, someone convicted of a drug or alcohol offense is about 120 days, and so you calculate that out. Our clients uh, do a shorter time in our programs at less cost, and we're more successful. And, yeah. and with your daily cost, do you have any, like, let's take the residential portion yes. of your program. What would it cost per day as a, you know, $65 in jail? Do you know what it 
the, the, ours is just a little bit less, about 10% less than that. 10% less. But again, okay. our length of stay is shorter. Now, yeah. as I was thinking about this, it also strikes me that if you put somebody in jail, yes, you know, they have 120 days or whatever, right. and they're not going to have access to alcohol or drugs mm -hmm. or whatever. But then they're back out on the street, and they haven't changed anything. And those same people may end up back in jail again. What you're trying to do and what you're showing with this recidivism rate mm -hmm. is it's not just that one jail mm -hmm. sentence. It's the multiple jails. Exactly. Center. I've yeah. had a number of clients to share with me. Lana, if I had not had an opportunity to come through this treatment program, I would have done jail time, but then returned right back to substance use. And with the tools that we give them, they're able to maintain a substance-free lifestyle and be satisfied. Now, there are a couple of new programs that weren't in the old uh, levy. And what are those, and why were they at it? Right. Well, there, there are just a, a couple programs that have been added. Um, the, the goal was to keep the, as you noted, to keep the a reduction in taxes at less than or more than 50 percent, which we've done, and it's only $10 a year on the average $100,000 household um, or uh, property value. And um, the new programs are the Coalition for Drug Free Greater Cincinnati, which is a prevention and education program in the schools named at youth. Um, it's been a very successful program. It, it was the number one program in the country about four years ago. Um, in terms of prevention programs. So is this a national program that is now operating it, here? It, it, it's been an operation here. Uh, Congress, former Congressman Rob Portman founded it, uh, mm -hmm. along with John Pepper, Damon Lynch, and Hope Taft um, uh, okay. about 15 years ago. And it's been one of the most successful prevention programs in the United States. And so we're going to uh, try to uh, expand that proven program out into the community a little bit farther. The second program is the Off the Streets program, which is this is going to provide uh, some uh, funding uh, from the county, whereas right now the city and foundations and some others are funding it to make sure it can continue in operation. And then the third program is a the new SAMI court program uh, that uh, you mentioned that will provide assessment and treatment services for the clients who are referred from there. And who ends up in that program? I, I, this is all a swim for people who sure. right. don't sure. live in your world. <laughs> yes. So, Sammy, what? Uh, what? Sub Substance abuse mental illness is what Sammy stand, stands for. And these are clients who come in who have had drug and alcohol and mental health problems and uh, kind of get crossed up between the systems. And so, this court is uh, going to try to intervene. The specialty courts, whether it's the housing court, the mental health court, the drug court, uh, mm -hmm. you know, veterans courts are now being developed. Reentry courts are extremely successful because they give the personal time to clients and the judges tend to know the issues and have resources at their disposal to be more effective and isn't that what we all want? Yeah, and, and, and ex exactly because what we have found is that those individuals who are treated for a substance problem but not the mental health piece simultaneously, they tend to have less favorable outcomes whereas those who are treated simultaneously for both issues have tremendous outcomes. And sometimes people you know, who have mental, underlying issue is mental illness. Um, if they get off their prescribed meds, they start using street drugs or other exactly. drugs, and it, they ended up getting arrested for a, a drug problem, but the real issue is the mental health issue, and until you deal with that, yeah. You know, it's not really the drug issue. You're absolutely exactly. right, and they're self-medicating because they don't like right. the way the psychiatric drugs make them feel. Mm -hmm. So they'll drink alcohol, they'll take some, they'll s s smoke marijuana, whatever, and then another series of problems come up for them. Here's the hard question I always have to ask in this situation: If this fails, mm -hmm. what happens? Well, unfortunately, in this particular case, because the situation the the county county funding is in, in general, the county budget, you've talked to mm -hmm. on your show many times about this over yes. the last year and a half, and not just Hamilton County, but everywhere, <laughs> everywhere, right? With the economic downturn or economic uh, depression we're in, um, there will be no programs after uh, the end of December, and 5,000 people a year whose lives we impact will not be served, and the costs that we just talked about for jail, for emergency rooms, for worker productivity. Back in. Th those are back in, right? Mm -hmm. And it's and it's somewhat. You remember the old commercial, "Pay me now or pay me later." Right. Um, that you know, if we don't support these ongoing services at a 50 percent reduction in taxes and only ten dollars, uh, you know, would you spend ten dollars to save a life? Is what I'm going to ask you. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, people will do that. So we got a great community. We hope they'll continue to support it. Dan, this is a complicated um, set of issues around what si sounds simple. Issue four. If you would like to read more about this complex or seemingly complicated levy, check out the website at www.familyservices.com.
www.ballotandtreatment.com or a straightforward information on many ballot issues can be found at the League of Women Voters site at smartvoter.org. Thank you for being here this morning and, um, well, I don't take sides. So uh, <laughs> yes. I will see how this comes out. But thanks for uh, having us. Thank, thank you. you. Stay tuned. After the break, I'll be joined uh, by two first time candidates for city council. Welcome back. In the crowded field race that is Cincinnati City Council, it is difficult for non-incumbents to get attention and traction. I am joined this morning by two more first-time candidates. Amy Murray, who is president of a small company, the Japan Consulting Company. Uh, Amy worked for Procter & Gamble for a number of years as con in the consumer development area. And Ms. Murray is an endorsed Republican who lives with her husband and children in Hyde Park, where she is a past president of the Neighborhood Council. And Kevin Flynn, a real estate attorney and the president of the Board of Trustees of Drake Hospital. Mr. Flynn is endorsed by the Charter Committee of Cincinnati. He lives with his family in Mount Airy, where he also grew up. In 2002, Mr. Flynn was involved in a serious automobile accident that left him uh, in a wheelchair as a quadriplegic. Welcome to Newsmakers, and I, I have to reveal conflicts of interest. <laughs> Kevin is a former student, and as far as I can tell, uh, I think you still owe me a paper. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, Amy, as a new, you know, first time running, what is it that caused you, on a content side, to think that you ought to run for council this time? I just feel that the city is at such a tipping point. We really have to make a decision what way the city is headed. And with my experience at Procter & Gamble, I have the background being able to set a vision, plan your priorities, and plan a budget. And we really need that at city council right now. So I just felt that I had something that I could offer. As I say, I'm just a businesswoman, a mom, and a community leader, but I think that's what we need right now. We need people with the discipline to really help manage a budget and move the city forward. Kevin, what about you? Well, you know, I've, I've always thought service is the rent we pay for the life we've been given. I've been blessed in my life, and I'm at a point in my life where I can give back to the city that I love, where I grew up, where I've raised my family, and I bring a skill set that is missing on council. We don't have a great variety of backgrounds on council. We have a lot of government experience, but not a lot of non-government experience. And so I think I can bring that perspective to council. And for both of you, if, if you were elected, mm -hmm. you would be facing almost immediately a very difficult budget issue. And let's start with Amy, but how would you approach, I'm not so much all of the details, but yes. how would you approach this serious budget deficit that we've got, whether it's 51 million, <laughs> a little bit less, a little bit more, really isn't the issue. Mm -hmm. We've got a big one. What are you going to do? I think what you have to do is look at a really good approach to how are you going to face the budget. And what I do is I would set the priorities of what are the priorities that we need to provide to the citizens and businesses of the city of Cincinnati. What do you think the priorities should be? I think be? the priorities, it has to be public safety, police and fire, and then our basic services. People want to have the roads plowed in the winter. We need potholes fixed. We need water, sewer. So I think that's a priority. And then we have to look at the other priorities and really put together our list. And then depending on if the budget is smaller than we thought or larger, then we can already have on our priorities On the flip side set. of that, mm -hmm. very honestly, what's at the lowest rung of your priority list? You know what, I can't answer that because I have to talk about what I think is important. And it just depends on how much funding we have for the city. And I think it's, too early to say that because as non-incumbents we don't have access to line item by line item in the budget. Mm -hmm. I do think there's other things we need to do that I'm sure we'll talk about like shared services that will bring in revenue to the city. Okay. But it'd be very premature to answer who gets cut until you've had a chance to look at the full budget. Kevin, what do, how would you approach the budget? Well the first thing if I were on council now is I would have started last December. They passed a budget last December for 2010 that had a $10 million deficit built into it. If you're running a company and your financial person comes to you and says, 
if we meet our revenue goals, we're going to be okay this year. But next year, even if we meet our revenue goals, we're going to be $10 million in the hole. That's no way to run a business. It's no way to run a city. But we're faced with that. It's not too late. It's going to make it more difficult. So what would be your priorities? Well, well, first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to start now. I'm not going to hold off till after the election because a dollar saved in the 2009 budget is worth two for 2010. Okay. Where would you save? Well, first of all, $51.5 million is 4% of the total budget. Everyone keeps talking about only the general operating budget. There's a $1.2 billion annual budget that the city is faced with. Some of those funds are restricted, but even the restricted funds we have to look at because they have general operating budget yep. overtones. If you get a grant from the federal government, they almost always contain 10 to 15 percent for administration. Administration flows over to the general operating budget. Mm -hmm. We have $63 million budgeted next year in general capital. Capital is important. Capital investment in our city is important. But when city council has placed us in the crisis that they placed us, maybe we wait a year to replace $11 million worth of automobiles. Okay. But capital, some capital designated money sometimes cannot be moved over to operating. Dan, the, the, the capital monies that I'm talking about are general capital monies. Okay. This is They're not, not designated, not bonded. There's hundreds of millions okay. of dollars of other capital monies. Well, and the one thing that, that Kevin touched on also that when you look at the budget from last November, it was projected that we'd have a 5% increase in tax revenues and then it was lowered to 3%. And my question is how can you possibly have accepted that when we have the city where companies are not giving bonuses, companies are not making their projections, to say that the city is going to have increased revenue from these companies, that is not possible to even think of. So I really think we need to relook at our forecasting system and do long-term forecasting okay. so that we can plan appropriately. Do you both think that we're going to actually have to have significant layoffs in this new budget? I think with 51.5 million, we're going to have to do something like that. My point is, I think public safety is key. Two things okay. on the new budget. I don't think we can increase taxes. It's not fair to put that burden on the taxpayer or the business owners. We'll lose jobs and we'll lose people if we increase taxes. So how else are we going to solve the budget deficit? And my thought with police and safety, because everyone says we need to lay off police, if we looked at a more managed program and did attrition for the police, when a police, we have about 30 to 35 a year that retire. If we reduce the numbers through attrition, if that's what we needed to do, that would be a much better way to keep our public safety levels where we need them. Kevin, what about you on that, specifically on this public safety area? Well, that, this is the real controversial part. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be controversial, Dan. If we don't have a strong police department, if we don't have a strong fire department, all the rest of the services in the city aren't going to matter because people are going to leave the city. You can balance this budget without laying off police and fire. Do you, do you think there are ways of reorganizing the, the two safety services in a way that could at one time improve service and save money and maybe reduce the personnel that are needed? I mean, uh, it, are we distributing yes. people and Dan, Dan you, resources you're, correctly. Speak, you're speaking the, the charter line of efficient and effective city government. By, by doing things, for example, in the fire department, we spend a million dollars a year training our firefighters to be paramedics, mm -hmm. to get them certified for that. I think that's a good goal. They saved my life seven and a half years ago, and, mm -hmm. you know, Everyone being trained as a paramedic when 75% of the runs are medical runs is a good thing. But we've got a recruit class coming in 2010 of fire recruits. And yet they don't make it a requirement to get the MS. That they that they have the certification of, of paramedic before they take the test. So we're just perpetuating that million dollar I'm aware expenditure. Of time. Uh, Amy, what about you on the issue of actual layoffs of police and fire? I don't think we should be doing that because we need to have public safety as a top issue right now. I think if we need to reduce the numbers, we should look at it through attrition because 
when we do layoffs, the layoffs are from the younger police officers that have just come in and graduated from the recruiting class. They're the ones that have the best and latest technology on the street, and they're the ones that are laid off. And I don't want to see our homicide detectives that are trying to solve these crimes and prevent crime in the street going to beat cops. So I really think if we do it through attrition and through a managed program, so instead of reacting all the time to the budget, we need to be proactive. Mm -hmm. Okay, I unfortunately am out of time, but hopefully uh, we've given people sort of a taste of uh, two more candidates. Both of you have websites, you're easy to find. Just Google uh, either one of your names uh, for Cincinnati City Council and you're there. So exactly. thank you very much for getting involved in, in the campaign and public service. This is what it's all about. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dan. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Next week, issues eight and nine, the highly debated levies related to the proposed streetcar and water districts. We could have talked about that. Have a good week.